Centuries ago, a great race of Robloxians walked the earth. They were said to possess such abilities to shape reality according to their wishes. They were known as the Builders. No object was beyond their creation, with their magic to create both great structures and detailed artwork from thought alone. These ancient rites were passed down among the generations until they were banished and scattered among the ruins. Today, this ancient knowledge can be yours once more. Discover the way of the master builders and take your building to a higher plane. Hello, my fellow gnomes, and welcome to the secrets of building. Now, I've just jumped into the suburban starter place here. And while I can't claim any great mastery to building myself, uh, I've been at it for quite a while now. So I've made plenty of mistakes along the way myself, and hopefully I can pass on a few of the things I've learned onto you guys. Now, before we get too much into the building, let's just run through some hotkeys, because I think they're one of the probably the most important things, just with computers in general. If you want to get faster at using any piece of software, you've really got to use some hotkeys. So obviously we've got all the buttons along the top and I could add in a part or something, but you really don't want to get caught. Um, say you want to copy this part. You really don't want to be right clicking on the explore window here and, and trying to do things. That's really going to slow you down. It's going to take a long time. If I want to do a click copy, I then have to scroll right up to the workspace again, click workspace, click paste into, all right, that takes a long time. So I uh, hopefully everyone knows control C, control V, much easier. You can create a copy. Uh, while you're dragging it around, obviously you've got R and T that you can move it about with to rotate and tilt it. And if you hold down the control key, that will turn it in on its sort of in space. Whereas if you're dragging and turning it, then you can just press R anyway. Uh, one more thing on the copying. I don't tend to do control C and control V because you notice when I do that, it appears on top of each other. So normally what I do is if I've got parts selected, I'll hit control D. And when I do that, it doesn't look like a copy appears, but a new copy appears inside of it, a duplicated version, which makes it quite handy from doing something like this tree here, because I can simply just move the next tree along and it's right beside it. Whereas if I was doing control C, control V, it's going to appear on top of it and I'm going to have to drag it down. So that's just a little bit more of a shortcut, control D to duplicate much easier. Uh, other ones, obviously you've got control G to group parts together. So rather than having to sort of select parts individually, or you know, you click and drag and then select them both, just hit control G, you've got them grouped together then. So then when you hit one of them, you're then dragging all of them. So oh, one more one more hotkey is we've got Control one to five to select these on the top. So we've got select, move, scale, rotate. And obviously if you click a part, generally you're just clicking and dragging. Um, but if I hit control two, I'm straight to the move on axis tool, hit control three, I've got the scale tool. So that's handy as it kind of keeps you on the part rather than having to move your mouse off onto other things on the menu. So I try and use that a fair bit, control one, two, three, four, makes things a bit quicker and easier. And then you've also got the camera as well. So obviously, hopefully everyone knows how to move the camera around. Um, but a good thing to know, be aware of, which I didn't actually know this for quite a while, I'm embarrassed to admit, but if you hold down the shift key, it does slow down the camera movement. This is especially good if you're doing like detailed work. Say I'm working on uh, like this sign over here. It'd be quite difficult for me to get in close. It's very difficult, you know, it's sort of jerky movements with the camera moving back and forth. So if I hold down the shift key, I've got a slower, more controlled movement where I can get in at the exact angle that I want to, making it a lot easier. Another thing to get around is it can be quite tiresome trying to like zoom in and out all the time if you're trying to get across the map quickly. Uh, if you select the part that you're wanting to edit, so if I click this tree over there, and then I just hit F, I'll zoom straight to that part. So that speeds things up a lot. Just clicking something, selecting F, and you'll go straight to it. So that's hotkeys out of the way. Now I want to talk a bit about moving things on the axis. Because why wouldn't you just want to drag parts? So obviously this is what 
most people start out doing, it's certainly how I started off doing things. And it's pretty effective, right? You can create copies, move them where you want to and so on. You can create some kind of staircase thing here. But the problem with just dragging is it does make it hard to be accurate. So I've not really got these staircases lined up as you can see. They're a bit wonky, aren't they? And obviously I could get them straight just by dragging, but it is a little bit fiddly. I've got to be careful. So if you use the move on axis tool, you can just move it on a single axis, which makes you much more accurate. You can't really slip and move it all over the place. We're just moving it up and down. And it's also handy, like here, if I'm talking about this tree, say I want to move it over to the left here, and I'm, I might get caught on other objects. So I'm gonna get caught on this stop sign here, and it's gonna kinda of get in the way. I'm gonna keep getting caught. It's gonna fly all over the place, which isn't really what I want. Whereas if I was using it on the axis, then I can just easily move it forwards a bit, to the left a bit, and I'm not gonna get caught. It's just gonna move straight through. Now, this is because uh, collisions are disabled normally, but you can enable at the top. There's a setting to turn on collisions, turn these on, and then look, I won't be able to then move outside of the bounds because this road or this paving's in the way. Although if I push it really hard, I can get right the way through to the side. So it's pretty cool. Uh, another thing you might have noticed, which has come to studio relatively recently, is there's two modes. There's a geometric mode at the top and a physical mode. So geometric is the default, what I'm on right now. But if I switch over to physical, you'll notice these all turn green. Now, while you're in physical mode, it's a bit like interacting with the physics world. So you'll notice if I try and move this tree now, I can't actually drag it. That's because the tree is anchored, which kind of means that it's anchored in place and the physics isn't going to interact with it. So if you notice, I've got this part attached to this ball here. It's got a rope constraint attaching the two. And if I just went and clicked run here, so the game would actually be running, and you'll notice I've got this ball attached. They both fell to the ground. And if I was to drag this part around, well, the ball would move around. And also if I anchored uh, this part and let the ball fall to the ground, obviously the, the ball would swing around, attach the rope, but the part would stay where it was. Now, if we're editing and the game isn't running, we can have it on physical mode. We can set this part to unanchored. And what we can actually do is we can move this around while we're editing and watch how it interacts with the constraint. So you wouldn't normally use this for building, but it's pretty useful if you've got some attachments, you wanna see how they interact. Maybe you've got a door or something. So that's all four of these main modes covered here. But there is one other mode you might have noticed. If you go on the model tab, we've also got this transform option. Now you might have wondered what this does. So that's control five to transform an object. And when you do that, you notice loads of different things suddenly appear on our screen. We've got some rotating, rotation icons. We've got an arrow and all sorts. So it's probably easiest to do this on a single part. It makes it a bit clearer. You'll also have these little dots as well. Essentially, the transform tool is a combination of move, scale, and rotation all in one. So it allows you to do a sort of a rotation where it gives you this big wheel here. So if I move it around inside the wheel, I get it in increments. So I can do a 90 degree rotation. If I'm outside, then it's be individual degrees. Gives me a bit more precision. And I could also uh, resize it upwards, you see there or I could just move it upwards. So it just allows you to have a combination of all of them inside the same tool. To be fair, I don't use transform a lot, but it is pretty handy. Probably the most useful feature is the snap to grid feature. So let's say I took this part, I moved it over here, uh, and I sort of put it at some crazy angle, right? Rotate it down to the side, like that, okay? So it's at a pretty odd angle now. And if I wanted to build things on this part, well, I could click a part and drag it over, which would kind of work. Um, but then if I want to start rotating it on here, well, rotation isn't gonna line up properly. If I want the rotation to be relative to this part, there's not really any way to do it. Look, it's gonna be the wrong way. Now, if I use the transform tool, what I can actually do is use this object or this button, sorry, in the top left, 
which allows me to snap to the grid. So I can click that, click on this part, and now I'm aligned to this grid. So I can move it and resize it along here. And if I want to rotate it, you'll see it's actually relative to the part it's on now, which makes things a lot easier. Okay, so that's most of the basic modes and such covered. Bear with me. Now I want to move on to why uh, scale is important. So I've got two buildings over here. Firstly, I've got this building. It's a pretty basic one. I just threw it together in a few minutes, okay? So don't judge my building too hard. But it kind of looks okay, right? It's a basic house. It's got a doorway. It's got a window. It's got a roof, okay? It's a house. It passes. Now, I've just built this, like I said, in a few minutes. But if I click, I click play here. So I join in with my character. You'll notice the main problem with this house, it's not really the detail. It's just the general scale. We walk in, we can already see this doorway is way too big for my character. And if I go into the window, I can't actually see out of this window. It's way above my head. And I've got to jump right up so just so I can see out. And it's like I'm some tiny little child. You know, the house just isn't to the right scale at all. It's completely wrong. So obviously this is a problem, as if the objects in your game aren't really to scale and they don't fit together. It's not really going to feel like a very immersive experience. It's all going to be a bit weird. Uh, this is pretty easily done if you're building a studio. Uh, but there's a pretty easy solution. You don't have to go into play mode. Just go on plugins. Uh, and there's this build rig option. Uh, some of these plugins are ones I've installed. But the build rig option is just there by default. So R15, click block rig. And then a little character will appear, a little dummy. And you can use him while you're building to help measure things up. So we could have made sure that this doorway was actually human sized or Robloxian sized. Uh, and so then we wouldn't have ran into this issue we had where things didn't really line up. Now, conversely, I would say you can go a bit too far on this one. So for example, I've done another one over here. And this one, as you can see, is much more closer to Robloxian sized, right? It's much better proportions. But you can go a bit too far. So if I go and click play here, I can head in with my character and it just feels very tight already, the doorway. And I can get in and the camera's sort of pushing up against things. And although there's plenty of room for my character to move around, it feels rather cramped, especially if I'm trying to get behind this uh, till here and I'm trying to see the customer. There really isn't a lot of room for my camera to move around in. So you've got to bear in mind that sometimes having the most lifelike into scale, even if this it would be an accurate representation of an actual shop in real life, it might not be the best thing for your game, especially if it's third person. So you have got to take in a bit of gameplay as well. Now, if this was a first person game, it probably would be less of a problem. You can see already, you know, my camera's not going to get caught on things and it still feels a little bit tight, but it makes it a lot better. Another advantage to using a smaller space like this is there's not loads of space I need to pad out. Whereas here in this really big room I had, I have so much space to fill and that can be a big problem. You certainly don't want to have your character just walking for really long distances with nothing to do. So I have a pretty good example for that and that is Fort Lucy. This is a really old build I did many, many years ago, almost 10 years ago now. And it's for an old war group. Now you can see how massive the map is for absolutely no reason. In fact, I timed me walking the length of the map. It took me almost 90 seconds. And as you can see, there's nothing really there either. It's mostly flat ground. So pretty boring for the player to have to walk that far. And another problem when you end up with these really big spaces is like you have to fill them with something. So when you're filling things, you really don't want it to look all the same. For example, look at all these desks I've got in this room here. It really doesn't look very good. So an alternative to that is you want to try and have some variation. So back in our suburban uh, village or town, wherever this is supposed to be, and let's say you want to make a forest here, okay? Now, the quickest way to make the forest would just be like this, and I'll go duplicate, 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 and so on, and then I would copy all of these, duplicate them all over again, and I could just do it like this, and I'd get a perfect grid, and I would kind of fill it up with a forest, okay? So there you go, that's a forest, but it looks really bad, doesn't it? 
So this is what I would call cookie cutter places. You really don't want to look like you've just gone and copy and pasted a bunch of things, which we have. So the way to add variation, whoop, I'm dragging this all over the place, uh, can be quite subtle. So with this forest, wouldn't even need to have different tree molds, even though that would be ideal. Uh, so all I'm going to do is I'm going to add in a copy. I'm just going to drag it this time rather than using the axis tool. I know I said about it earlier, but we're going to disable. Just use drag for now. And I'm going to put them in a bit more random positions, especially for something organic. You want it to be a bit more random. So already that looks a lot nicer than it being a straight grid. Another thing we can do is change the scale of it. So duplicate this one. And I'll bring the scale down. So I've got a smaller tree. And I can dot some of these around. And already that's starting to make a big difference, I think. Looking a lot more natural, having trees sort of in different ages, different growths. And ideally, if this tree wasn't fully uh, symmetrical, you could also rotate it round a bit. Though obviously here, rotating the trees isn't going to make a difference as they're identical. But yeah, I think that looks a lot better for us than we had a few minutes ago. So variation is definitely important. Uh, let's talk about increments. You might have noticed me using it a second ago when I use the move up here. Now, a lot of people, they'll see the move, they'll see it limited to one stud or something, and think, well, I want to be tied to one stud, and they just go and they untick this straight away, and then they can move it perfectly freely. There's no limit at all placed on them. Uh, but I would recommend you to keep this enabled. Let me explain. So over on this side of the map, you'll see I've got two houses built here. One on the left, one on the right. They're pretty similar, almost identical. Uh, now, one is built a bit better than the other. Well, better in my opinion, anyway. Maybe you'll disagree. Uh, now, it's probably not immediately obvious which is the better build. So, let's take a look, shall we? So, this one on the left, we're going to look at first. And if we get in real close, you'll see there's a little bit of what some people call Z fighting or C frame fighting. So this is when two textures are in exactly the same place and they kind of fight over each other like this. You see they're flashing back and forth. I think there's maybe some more on this side. Yeah, these ones are flashing away. So already that kind of, that's a, a minus mark, right? It kind of looks like it's a bit rushed. It's not a great thing to have in your game. If we go over and look at the, the steps on this side, we can see there's parts overlapping. There's a little overlap there so it stands out. And if we look at this sort of um, railing here, we can see the sort of gaps and edges and it just doesn't look smooth at all. It looks very awkward. And if, as well, if we look at the front of the building, we can see that these columns, they don't actually line up. They're kind of dotted all over the place. The building isn't symmetrical at all. It all looks quite odd. And sure, we could go in and play and the average player probably wouldn't even notice any of these as this is a perfectly fine building. And obviously, if you're just doing an FPS or something, you're not really going to notice. Although this step, because they're funny heights, it does actually make it difficult to get up sometimes. Uh, but if you want to build good places, you really ought to be trying to make sure you're using increments. Because if you don't, you can make little mistakes like this, little gaps, little overlaps. Obviously, I've exaggerated it in some places so you can see clearly. And another problem you can get is that these little mistakes can build up over time. So... Now I'm on the top floor, you can see some of these mistakes are really starting to show here. As if you just have a little mistake at the beginning and you build on it and build on it, eventually these mistakes can be quite big. So now let's go over next door. So it's pretty much identical. The only difference is that everything is built using increments. I think I kept it to 0 0.5 studs. Okay, so let's have a look at the steps. We can see it's all smooth, no gaps. The railing is perfectly smooth all the way around. And it's exactly the same. It's just a, a spherical part and two cylinders. Steps all nice and smooth. And it just feels a lot cleaner to me. All the windows perfectly lined up. There's eight windows on every side. Everything just feels a lot smoother. And you might not even notice, like the average player, but I think it's just a sort of subconscious thing to see symmetry. And it, 
I don't know, personally, I think it makes a massive difference. But it's not just for the sake of the player either. It's also it's going to save you a lot of time as the builder. So if we take this and we measure this, okay, we look at it, go to uh, its size, and we'll just size it up so it perfectly fills the entire block. Go down to 0.5 so we can get the exact thing. There we go. So move it up to the top, make this part fill the entire building, and we can see it's exactly 40.5 in each direction. Okay, I could have made it completely 40, but the reason I do that is because each of these window sections is actually five studs across. So 555, five, five, and then it perfectly lines up with an extra 0.5 on the end. Now, if we looked at this building before, which I didn't use increments before, you can already see the size is 52.082. And then if we bring it up to the top so it matches. It's 41 by 38. And there's loads of decimal points, and that looks really messy. And that's a problem if you want to make slight edits later. So we can see that these two, uh, these two floors aren't actually the same height. And I've wanted to extend, uh, extend this a bit. It's going to be quite tricky. So if I had that turned off, well, sure, I can extend that and I can kind of move it over. But it's very difficult for me to make sure that I'm getting the same increments each time. And if I'm not careful, I'm going to end up with oddly spaced gaps like I've got here. Compare that with this building, which everything is neatly spaced. So each of these, I think, did I say it was five studs or was it four studs across? I can't remember. Uh, so if I move that five studs, yeah, there you go. See, it's going to be perfectly level. And I can copy another one. And each one perfectly lines up just by setting the increment to five studs at the top there. So that makes it really easy to copy things. And I can move it up. I think it's, uh, is that 0.5? I think each stud is is uh, 10, 10 studs high with then a 0.5 ceiling that makes it really easy for me to copy things move it about and i don't have to worry then it just makes it so much easier to make these changes rather than having to spend ages trying to freehand things and carefully move things into place to try and sort of eyeball where they go now you don't have to keep it on 0.5 all the time it's a good thing to move it about so if i'm doing like big really big walls i probably have it on one stud I don't need the decimal places. I've got this part here. And I'm building something really big. In fact, I could even have it on 10 studs if I wanted. That would be fine, right? If I'm big wall. I'm quite happy to be in increments of 10. If I'm doing a bit more detail, then I can go down to 1 or 0.5 as I've done here. Um, I don't think I've gone below 0.5 here. Uh, but if you need more detail than 0.5, then I would probably go to either... Well, you can go to 0.25, which is obviously half of 0.5, or 0.2 I sometimes use as well, because that's obviously a fifth of one stud, so that can be quite handy. Or 0.1 stud if you need it. But really, I wouldn't go below 0.1. There's very, very few occasions you'll need to. Even for detailed work like this, generally 0.1 stud is good enough, and you can get pretty small and detailed parts with 0.1. I suppose 0.05 might be acceptable as you can still get a little bit of control there. You've still got a little bit of snapping to the grid but if you have it completely turned off then you've really not got any control to keep things consistent and things will start to go a bit skew as we've already talked about. Okay, so we're almost at the end of the video but there's one more thing I want to talk about and that is the contentious toolbox and the free models so a lot of people have quite strong opinions about these some people say that you should never use free models you know they're like oh you shouldn't just steal other people's work you know you should build your own thing and and so you're actually skilled you know if you're just using other people's builds then well you've not really made anything right and some people never touch free models i mean personally my take is i wouldn't normally take a house like this uh Generally, if I'm making a game, I kind of want it to have my own feel. So I wouldn't really take a whole house. Uh, but what I might do, I do quite often, is I'll just take a small item. So say this tower block here, I might want to put something in it. Because if you're using, you know, if you're taking this McDonald's restaurant, and every game has one of these, 
then your game is not really going to have its unique identity. But if I just want a plant pot, say, uh, I really don't think that people are going to be seeing this plant pot everywhere, and it's not really going to distract from the game. So I can quite happily dot some plant pots about my building, and it just saves me time. Prevents me really from having to reinvent the wheel for something that's quite simple. And it's not really a big element of my game, but it just helps me decorate a little bit. Now, one thing you have got to think about if you're going to use free models like this is what we talked about earlier with uh, having cutty cutter places. So you've got to use a bit of variation again. So I probably wouldn't put all these plants on each floor like I've done here. You know, you could mix it up. You could use a slightly different plant pot, right? Or you could change the color. I don't know if you can change the color of this one because I think it's a mesh. Uh, so I don't think we can actually change. Oh, we can change the color of the soil. But I don't think we can change. Oh, we can. We can change the color of the plant pot. So that's pretty cool. And I think if we wanted, we could make uh, this plant a little bit bigger. So we could have a bigger plant if we wanted. Some little things like that could help add a little bit of variation so it didn't look all the same everywhere. Uh, but probably most importantly, if you do decide to use free models, is to check for viruses because there are a lot of hidden sort of malicious scripts that people like to hide. And the best way to search for these is to go into the explore window, this little search window at the top. And if you type in script, what it'll do is it'll show every script that's in your game. Now, in this case, because it's a template, there's quite a lot of scripts. So uh, there's all these convenience store drinks that are full of scripts. I'd say a good approach to trying to clean up scripts is to see if you actually know what they do. You know, if you have a script and you've got no idea what it does, I'd say it's a pretty good idea to delete it. You don't really want to be having random scripts around. So I found this one. It's called Place Cleaner version 0.5. And this is actually an antivirus script. Uh, so people sometimes put these in and have these weird names that are often the name of these virus scripts. And they just try and duplicate themselves all through your game and it'll slow you down. But actually, this antivirus script itself, I would kind of regard as a bit of a virus because if we look at the code, it's actually trying to run this loop constantly, you know, every single frame. I mean, it's not possible to wait 0.001, so it'll just end up running every frame and it's going to look and all through the workspace and see if any of these exist. I mean, really, this is a bit abusive. You don't need to have a script checking all the time. Just search through your scripts, make sure you don't need it. And you'll sometimes see a script call something like, do not delete. Right, if you see a script called this, like I guarantee it probably is suspect. So I would just delete that as well. Like I say, if you don't know what a script does, then I think you're pretty safe to remove it most of the time. Now, if you are worried about viruses getting into your game, then the best free models to use are actually the ones endorsed by Roblox. So you see, they've got this little sort of orange badge down here in the bottom right. And these are the official Roblox endorsed models. So you see, we've got a park bench, we've got a trampoline. And you know if you add these in, they're safe to use and they're normally pretty quality made models. So this is a pretty cool trampoline. This is a pretty cool park bench as well. Because let's be honest, you know, a lot of the free models that are out there aren't that well made. But these are both well made and you can be sure they're safe. So yeah, I would definitely consider using uh, this bench in one of my games, for example. But there we go. I think I've talked long enough. Uh, hopefully you have found some of this helpful. If you did, then be sure to leave a like and leave a comment as well because I could probably easily do a part two on this. I barely scratched the surface. There's still loads of things I could talk about. So be sure to hit a like and let me know if you'd like to see a part two. And why not subscribe as well? It massively helps the channel. But thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next episode. Goodbye.